Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Uh, if you haven't figured it out by now, I am uh, well and truly into bayonets. Now, uh, I thought I'd take the opportunity today to um, go through five of my favourite bayonets from history. And, well, probably my five favourite bayonets from history. Um, the criteria I've sort of cast myself is I'm really interested in the history and the look and the aesthetic more than the uh, the practical functionality of it. I know that's not going to be the same criteria that other people are going to have, but um, hey, that's what I've gone with. Uh, that being said though, guys, I'd love to hear uh, what you're into. So comment below and uh, tell me what your favourites are. I'd love to um, hear from you. Anyway, cracking on. So number five, my fifth favourite I'd have to say is the Swiss uh, 1914 Pioneer Sawback. Uh, anything Swiss is going to be absolutely gorgeous and very, very well made. Not to mention it has this big, beautiful sawback. Um, these blades are quite scarce down here in Australia. And uh, I managed to source this one pretty cheap from Switzerland, so I did uh, pretty well for myself. But as you can see, it's an absolutely gorgeous blade, massive sawback, and um, it's a very, very practical bayonet as well. So it's designed as a, uh, a sidearm. It's pretty much a sword. It's uh, got a bit of a bulge at the top, so it's really good for chopping. It's got the sawback. It's a very utilitarian uh, bayonet. Now, when I was considering uh, this one in my top five, I was sort of back and forth a little bit between this one, the Vettelie, and the Model 1906. Um, I ended up choosing this one because this is the one that saw the most use, the one that was issued in the largest numbers, and um, it was the mainstay for the longest period of time. The Vettelies were uh, smaller numbers from what I can tell. And um, while absolutely gorgeous, the leather grips weren't nearly as functional as these absolutely solid wooden and steel ones. Then the Model 1906, um, that had the same blade profile as the Vettelie with a straight blade. Very, very beautiful. I love that bayonet to bits. And the only reason I didn't choose that as my favourite over the uh, the Model 1914, it comes down to the fact that it was an intermediate bayonet. It um, bridged the gap between the Vettelie and the Model 1914, and there weren't very many of them made at all. Like, from memory, 15,000 or something like that, so that's barely any. That being said, though, I'm trying to get my hands on a Model 1906. I did get offered one pretty cheap recently, so I might think about that. So the Model 1914 Pioneer Sawback absolutely gorgeous blade and very very deserving for my um top five i'll just clear some space here a bit crowded now number four number four had to go to the turkish model 1890 uh, these were made in germany uh, under contract for the ottoman empire they're extremely well made they're absolutely gorgeous bayonets Got a very, very iconic look. And what I really enjoy about them the most, well, one, one of the features I really enjoy about them, probably not the most, but definitely up there, is all the script is in Ottoman Turk. And I can't tell you um, the amount of time I've spent um, going through Google Translate and looking up uh, what all the characters mean and trying to decipher who the manufacturers were, data manufacturer, as well as figuring out all of the... Um, religious iconography uh, proof marks. So I've had an absolute uh, blast with these bayonets. And in all honesty, the video I did on this bayonet was my favorite. Um, I enjoyed making that video probably more than any other. But very, very well made. I love the um, the profile of the, the Quillen with the ball finale at the end. It's very, very Turkish, very, very Ottoman. Now, the Turks have a reputation for making absolute crap, and they did. Everything after World War One, once the Ottoman Empire has been dissolved, is it's pretty crap. Um, poor manufacturing, a lot of... Uh, they took a lot of really nice bayonets and just butchered them into really shitty ones, like yeah, your model 1935s. This sort of predates that. This is, this is very, very well made, and um, being living in Australia and being a born in New Zealand. Um, history of uh, our two countries, um, well, Australia is sort of forged in Gallipoli. 
Australia federated in 1900, 1901, whichever it was. And the first real conflict it saw was in Gallipoli against the Ottoman Turks. And um, I can really imagine something like this, in fact, this exact one, because this is a Gallipoli capture, um, coming from that battlefield. So, as an Australian slash New Zealander, Jill Sisson, <laughs> it's um, very, very iconic for um, the history of both my countries. And an absolutely gorgeous piece. Very, very nice. Unfortunately, the leather on the scabbard is starting to go a little bit on this one. I've treated it and tried to strengthen it as best I can, but um, I don't think there's any saving it. Eventually, time will catch up. So very, very deserving, uh, number four. If you haven't already, I highly recommend you watch the video on that one because the information in that video is absolutely fantastic. As I said, it was by far my favorite video to make. Um, unfortunately, I think it's got the, the least views of any video I've done as well, which is um, a bit disappointing, but it's the way the cookie crumbles. Now, um, number three. Number three is something I had my eyes on from the moment I started collecting bayonets. From the first couple of Google searches I did, I had my eyes on one particular bayonet, and it was very hard to get down here in Australia, but I didn't rest until I eventually got my hands on one, and I was very happy with the one I eventually did get. And that was the Argentinian model of 1891. Now, in my opinion, this is the single best looking bayonet out there. There is, there is nothing that comes close. Well, there's a couple that come close. My first bit comes pretty close. As you can see, also made in Germany under contract for Argentina. This bayonet is just absolutely gorgeous. It's definitely a showpiece, except for obviously the, the crest that's been ground off, but hey, that's another piece of history that I enjoy. And um, this was another video that I really enjoyed making, the um, Argentina 1891 video. Um, I didn't know much about the history of Argentina, particularly around the, uh, the turn of the 20th century, and um, it was surprising learning that they were such a rich, prosperous uh, country with uh, well, such a wealthy country, and they could afford something so nice, and they, they chose to uh, really arm their military with something very beautiful. Uh, this was pretty much a purely aesthetic pick. But um, this has been one of my favourites, as I said, since those first couple of Google searches I did um, all that time ago. I do prefer the aluminium grip over the brass as well. That being said, I want to get a brass for myself. Uh, one of my mates has one. It's absolutely gorgeous. And um, yeah, I definitely want to get one, but probably with a crest if I can, but I'll set off for one without. One other point I should make on the Turk, actually, I'll jump back very quick. There's a lot of photos online, and there's a couple of collectors who have them. That you can get uh, sockets that connect into the um, muzzle ring and actually um, act as a earth for radio. So you collect, uh, connect your radio to your bayonet, stab your bayonet to the ground, and it acts as a um, earthing spike. Very, very cool. Um, I'll be very happy if I can never even get to play with one of those, let alone own one. Now, my second pick um, is very, very Australian. So during the Second World War, Australia had a, a shortage of submachine guns. And while waiting for the Sten, um, the Owen was developed by uh, Lysats. Uh, fantastic story, actually. I highly recommend you watch the Forgotten Weapons video on it. And um, yeah, the Owen gun was developed and um, it was extremely popular with Australian soldiers. It was made at a loss for the manufacturers. They made that it was a act of patriotism essentially for the manufacturers they made a a one percent profit per gun and uh they didn't get paid till the end of the war from memory so they took a loss uh, it was purely an act of patriotism and it was a fin absolutely fantastic submachine gun initially it wasn't developed to have a bayonet there were a couple of experimental ones which i adore and i'll never get my hands on um I might try talking to the War Memorial or the Infantry Museum, see if they'll let me play with one of theirs, because I think there's only three or four still in existence. But um, eventually, Australia designed a shortened pattern 1907 bayonet for their SMLE that was rejected. But that same bayonet was adopted for the Owen gun. And um, I've got one here. So this is my second favourite bayonet. 
Uh, this one's in pretty rough shape, and this is actually a Korean war manufacturer, just the way I like it. So I spent seven years serving full-time in the Australian Army. Um, the unit I served in had an extremely proud uh, history uh, dating back to the, uh, the Korean War, to the Battle of Kapiong, where uh, a very small number of, or well, one battalion of Australian infantry and one battalion of Canadian infantry held back the Chinese Spring Offensive from Seoul, uh, holding back uh, 10,000 odd soldiers for absolute days. They took uh, huge losses, and as a result of their actions, they they rewarded the uh, US uh, Presidential Unit Citation, uh, Little Blue Ribbon. Um, that, that history from my unit is, um, well, anyone who's served knows how important your unit's history is to you. So the fact that these were used in the Korean War, uh, these were used in the Second World War in the Owen Gun, which is absolutely iconic. And the Korean War, these were used on uh, SMLE, short magazine Lee Enfelds, in place of um, full length P1907s. In my mind, this is just a, a very, very iconically Australian bayonet. Uh, this is a uh, 1953 manufacturer, so it's made for the Korean War after the Battle of Kapyong. Uh, I highly doubt it ever saw any use with my unit, but um, hell, I probably even ne never left Australia, but it's in pretty rough, uh, rough nick. But these were used all the way through into the Vietnam War before they were eventually replaced. And it's just a shortened P1907, essentially. Very handy little uh, blade. Um, very, very expensive, unfortunately. If they weren't so expensive, I'd probably get a few more, but I got this one for an absolute steal. I got it for about 355 Australian dollars. Usually you see them sell for between 450 to 550, but I'm very, very happy with this little blade. And um, it's absolutely my number two and very, very close to my number one. It's definitely the most practical of um, all of my blades here. Um, yeah, this is another bayonet. I thoroughly enjoyed doing the videos on uh, pretty much all of my favourites. I had an absolute blast making videos for. Now, for my number one, if you've watched a few of my videos, you've probably heard me refer to it as my favourite quite a few times by now. And if you follow me on Instagram, I'd be surprised if you didn't know by now. But, um... My absolute favourite is the model 1886-93, or is it 92, I can't remember, uh, Labelle Bayonet, or Epe Bayonet. So this has obviously got a cruciform blade, and it's, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And what I really, really love about this particular blade is the history associated with it. So prior to World War I, um, France... They, they'd been humiliated by the Prussians or the Germans during the Franco-Prussian War uh, some years earlier, back in 1871-ish. And um, as a country, they, they felt a little bit of humiliation. And leading into World War One, there was a lot of resentment. And um, the propaganda machine really, really got going. And the people really bought into French propaganda against uh, Germany, the uh, Imperial Germany. And sort of the, uh, the spear point, or... <laughs> if you will, the, the bayonet point of the uh, the um, propaganda was this bayonet. It was on every poster. It was um, in songs. It was, you know, nicknamed Rosalie. It was very, very romantic and very, very effective propaganda. Um, I am a little addicted to uh, going through French propaganda posters from prior to and during World War One, And I love that, that, um, that romantic sort of feel to it. The idea that uh, they all believed uh, German soldiers would fall upon the uh, the points of their their long bayonets when in turn the Germans just turned around and said we're not scared of your knitting needles. Uh, that's another fantastic video I've done actually. That's um, another one of my favourites, my Labelle bayonet um, video. So it's just an absolutely gorgeous uh, bayonet. I love the hook quillen on it. I love the um, the modification 93, I think it was, uh, with the strengthened um, full length tang as opposed to the, the weak shaky handle. It's just an absolutely fantastic blade and um, one day I want to get my hands on one of the shortened trench knife versions of this bayonet, still retaining a, a hook quillen. Uh, I've come across photos, a couple now actually, two or th probably three or four now, where they've been cut down to about eight inches or so and um, 
soldiers would just stab them into the wall of the trench and hang a lantern from the hook quillen or hang anything from that. It's just a very, I don't know, it, it strikes me personally and I, uh, <laughs> I'm a sucker for it. That being said though, guys, uh, these are my um, five favorite bayonets uh, from history. Um, I do have a couple of honourable mentions. I do really enjoy the um, the pattern 1907, particularly with Hook Quillen. But um, I sort of chose the Owen over this because it's just so... It, it's a much more iconic blade and it's so much more relevant to uh, myself here in Australia and my uh, personal service in um, the Australian Army. But I'm definitely a 1907 fanboy. If you haven't figured out, I love all the different manufacturers. And the other honourable mention is, um, as I said, the Experimental Owen. And um, I will endeavour to try and get my hands on one of those and do a video. But from what I can tell, there's only three of them out there, or four of them out there, one or two in private hands and two in museums. Um, one of the museums has offered to let me have a look at it for, I think it was $130 an hour. And that's <laughs> including time where I've got to go through their archives and find it, so it could be a very, very costly endeavour. And it's also a good four or five hour drive away from where I am, but um, leave that with me and I'll see what I can do. Anyway, guys, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to find out uh, what your favorite bayonets are, what your favorite aspect of um, bayonets is, be it the history, the, the look of them, the, um, the practical use of them, the use of them as a combat knife, a survival knife, a trench knife, uh, what aspect about them that you enjoy and what particular bayonet that... Um, you'd call your favourite. Anyway, guys, uh, thanks for watching.